years and years ago, I had done a lecture quite different from this on design and happiness, which really was concerned about is it possible as a designer to become happier? And probably more important, is it possible to design things that would make an audience happier? Wow. Saturday morning and nobody has anything better to do than to listen to me. I'm very flattered. Uh, this is a full room, so my favorite room to speak in. Uh, so I'll just uh, start here immediately. Uh, as you already heard, we're going to talk about happiness. The whole thing came about because Years and years ago, I had done a lecture quite different from this on design and happiness, which really was concerned about is it possible as a designer to become happier? And probably more important, is it possible to design things that would make an audience happier? And that talk always had good feedback. So on my second sabbatical in Bali, I decided to make a film about it. And the idea of the film really was that maybe people have something from it, so meaning that I would feel that it would be meaningful. And seven years later, it was supposed to be a two-year project, but seven years later, we finally have the film. I'll quickly show you a trailer but then really, because I assume that many of you probably will see the film tonight or tomorrow, I'll just show the trailer and then we'll move into the exhibition. Is it coming? Yeah. Okay. Well, but we have no sound, I think. Perfect. Disaster. Okay. okay. I'm the director here. I'm going to make a decision. No! I'm just using the shit I'm talking about. I didn't want to make a film about the questions. I hate all this stuff. Oh, it's not about answers, it's about the right questions. Good, well done. May all the eight be This film started as a graphic design project six years ago. And somehow it all became about me. I'm just trying to ask the questions that I think you would ask uh, if you were if you were oh, crazy. crazy. Another person crazy. Me? It's different. Because I have an immediate experience of me. Trying to chase after something more meaningful to me that to be a big pain yes. Oi, oi, oi. I spent the past six years of my life working on this thing that says Okey-doke. So while we were making the film, the Institute for Contemporary Art in Philadelphia asked us to do a graphic design exhibition. 
And it wasn't that interesting for us because we already had that exhibition running throughout Europe, so it probably it would have mean it would have meant to put the same material again one more time. So we asked them to do it about happiness instead. And they agreed, and it basically was started as sort of like as a little side project for the film because we thought maybe we can make a couple of videos for the exhibition and have them, the museum, pay for it, and then we can use them for the film also, so it doesn't get from the budget of the film. And we went down, Philadelphia is very close to New York, so it's like only an hour and a half by train, so I went down with the train to see the museum, and they had a whole bunch of, you know, the usual nice galleries, but they also had a whole bunch of non-spaces, like, you know, let's say, stairways, ramps for wheelchair uh, access, hallways, and I asked, so how about these? Like, can we use these as well? And they said, well, nobody ever does, but be happy, right? Meaning, like, you know, do whatever you want with them. So that meant that the, our elevators then looked like this, or then there was a freight elevator that opened the other way around, so it uh, looked like this, and uh, this was the wheelchair uh, ramp that we uh, put all the research uh, in there and sort of like the takeaway of the whole thing was that basically if you don't ask you won't get like that uh, if I would have never asked casually how about these non-spaces the exhibition would only have started at half of the size and we made a little film about this that says exactly that if I don't ask I won't get This, of course, is Jessica. Uh, this is another designer who is not with us anymore. were pretty much as much fun as they look like. Uh, this is all shot with a phantom camera, so you don't really see anything in real life. You like everybody stands around the monitors during the shoot and or after the shoot and looks what came out. So let's see here, with a show of hands, who feels like a zero, who feels like shit? Number two, who feels pretty bad? One person, who is bored? Number four, well, two, three, three, four, per, four people, already five minutes into the lecture and already bored, that's not a good sign. Uh, six, who, who is okay? Okay, about half. I feel good, number eight. Wow, the other half. And I love life, number 10. Oh, still quite a lot, about 10. Okay, so I kind of knew this already. Like, I know the Ukraine is somehow in the middle of things. Not the worst, not the best, but roughly in the middle in worldwide happiness surveys. And if you talk about happiness, normally I'm not a big friend of definitions, but it's such a huge term where everybody thinks or everybody understands it really differently. So I'll quickly go through it. So number one, it's a 
an easy way to look at it is by how long it takes. So there's the very short happinesses, like joy and pleasure. An orgasm would be part of it, or uh, a happy moment would be part of it. But it takes, normally lasts for a part of a second or seconds. Number two, sort of like longer, maybe for hours, that's more associated with satisfaction or somehow well-being, you know, spending a Sunday afternoon on the couch when everything is perfect, good music and the newspaper, that sort of thing. And number three can be a lifelong happiness, which sort of entitles to find the thing that you're good for in life, to basically find meaning in life. And that, of course, can last a whole life. These three, you might notice, have nothing to do with each other. Meaning, to find or to fulfill your potential is completely different from having an orgasm, unless you're in the adult porn industry. Uh, but very few of us, I guess, uh, would be that. Factors affecting. Very surprising to me, activities. So roughly 40% of what makes people happy is basically an activity of things that they normally don't do. So for example, the fact that you chose on this Saturday morning at 12 o'clock to attend a lecture on happiness is, according to psychologists, a fantastic way to become happier. Even if you don't like what I have to say, just because you likely didn't do this yesterday or last week or last month, it already is a non-repetitive activity and therefore has a much bigger chance to make you happier. If you, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, if you're spending money, it is much more likely that it's going to improve your well-being if you spend it on an activity, specifically a non-repetitive activity, than if you spend it on something that you own. So if you have extra money going on a holiday, it's going to be a much better strategy than buying a car. Number two, life conditions. These are all the big things. If you're white, if you're black, if you're a woman or a man, if you live in a uh, in a rich country or a poor country, all those things have a surprisingly tiny uh, influence, mostly because you get used to it and you take it for granted. Number three, genetics do play a big role, roughly half, but you can't do anything about it, so I won't talk too much about it, but they do play a role. Some people won the lottery at birth and are happier than others. So if that is true that activities play such a big role, that would mean that I would have to do a lot of spontaneous things. And I, being born five miles from the German border, actually am not so great at it. I'm good at focusing, but I could definitely benefit from being more flexible, from doing more spontaneous things. So we made this little video called Be More Flexible, the the one you saw before with the balloons had no computer graphics in it. This one is pure computer graphics, was done by our friend Esteban, and it's, there's no camera involved, it's all done in CG. So, as I mentioned, makes no difference if you're a man or a woman. Makes no difference if you're born in the sunniest climate of the United States or in the shittiest climate of the United States, which is Buffalo, New York. Income makes a big difference until you make $85,000 a year. So that's a quite high income. 
meaning the average income in the United States is $50,000 a year. But, and it makes a huge difference if you have no money at all. But from $85,000 on, surprisingly, it makes no difference anymore. The, the disadvantages are even with the advantages. So yes, you can fly first class and you have the Ferrari, but the shitty cousin always asks you for money to borrow. Makes no difference if you're white or black. Older people are slightly happier than younger people, but just by a little bit. Uh, makes no difference if you're ugly or beautiful. Supermodels are just as unhappy as very ugly people. Now it starts to make a difference. If you go out a lot, meaning if you're an extrovert, if you have many, many friends and good friends, you will be happier than if you're a loner. And if you're strangely, if you are religious, you will be happier than if you're not religious. If you are married, you will be happier than if you're single. So I am not religious and I'm single, so I have many ways to improve my happiness uh, going forward. For the show, we had actually a pretty good advertising budget. So in Philadelphia, we had buses, but we had uh, many posters around the city. So that resulted in very good visitorships throughout all the shows. Overall, over half a million people have seen The Happy Show, and uh, it's still going on. So it's already quite by far the most successful graphic design show in history. The, we based, or basically, I of course, working up for the show and for the film, I read many, many, many books and I visited many, many scientists. The book that spoke to me the most was this one, The Happiness Hypothesis by Jonathan Haidt. If you're interested in the subject and want to read only one book, that's the one that I would recommend. And I'll leave it up for a second for you to take some pictures of it uh, for those of you who are interested. I read dozens and dozens, and I thought this one was the best. So I called him up, and it turned out that his wife is an artist, so he actually knew who I was, and we got along very, very well, and he agreed to become the scientific advisor for the film, and with that also for the show. In the book, he basically, or one of the reasons that I liked the book was because he was He's a scientist, so everything that he said, you know, had to be backed up by scientific research. And at the same time, he looked at the whole life very holistically. So it wasn't just about this tiny little uh, detail of psychology that he would disprove some other scientist. He really looked at the whole life. And he, in the book, in chapter two, says, in his experience, there are three strategies that he thinks are most effective when you want to up your happiness, when you want to increase your well-being. And that really spoke to me specifically the most effective. Because I had no desire to go into Freudian therapy for 15 years and then not being quite clear if it actually improved me or didn't improve me. I definitely wanted effective change. So out of the three, he said, first, meditation, second, cognitive therapy, third, drugs. And this, in this case, means legal drugs, so medication, pharmaceuticals. And in my case, I went on Lexapro, which is sort of, the technical term is an SSRI. It's sort of a Prozac-like anti-anxiety drug. Jonathan talks about the conscious and the unconscious mind, like the small rider who sits on the large elephant. Small rider being the conscious mind, elephant being the unconscious mind. And the rider thinks that he can tell the elephant what to do and where to go, but the elephant really has his own kind of ideas. And it's through these three strategies, meditation, cognitive therapy, and drugs, that the two can learn how to work together. And if they can work together, if they are in agreement, that would mean that you can live a fuller life. So 
I looked at some statistics from the United States. And if you look at a guy whose name is Dennis, and uh, no, actually first you look at a guy called George, and he doesn't know where to live, and he chooses to live in Georgia. And then you have a guy uh, whose name is Dennis, who doesn't know where, what kind of profession he should become, somehow dentist sounds best to him. And Paula, not sure if she should marry Jack or Joe, somehow chooses a Paul. And as strange as that sounds, there are more Georgias who live in Georgia, there are more Dennises who become dentists, and there are more Paulas who are marrying Pauls than would be normally statistically viable. Now, this is United States research, and when I first saw it, I thought, oh my God, those stupid Americans. Uh, you know, they are letting their elephant gangle them around without even being aware of it. Then I looked at my own family history. This is my mother, Carolina, getting married to my dad, Carl. This is my grandmother, Josefine, getting married to my granddad, Josef. Then this is, I think, joy, I think. This is disgust. No, this was joy, the other one was, no, this was surprise, and this is anger. And this is fear. So out of the six basic emotions, there's only one positive, joy. Everything else is either neutral or negative. So we have, by nature, more negative emotions than we have positive ones. And this also comes across, let me just go back one here, through a thing called in psychology the negativity bias. We are much more open to things that are negative than they are positive. If you uh, look at all newspapers, all news all around the world, they are mostly negative, not because the media is evil, it's because we want it that way. Every attempt to make a positive newspaper died in a week or two because nobody was interested. And the reason that is so is because we actually have a shortcut in our brain, which is called the amygdala. You see it here? That actually allows us to get negative emotions much, much faster than positive ones. We can actually feel danger before the eye is able to send the material back to the brain just by our body. And this, of course, comes from our prehistoric predecessors who really needed fear as an emotion to basically keep them alive. But of course, uh, I myself live a very, very safe life and I think that I would benefit much more if I would actually risk more. Second term in psychology that I'm going to talk about is presentism, which means that we tend to judge everything that comes in the future from our current point of view. If you ever went to a supermarket hungry and wound up buying much too much stuff, that's what presentism is. But in a much more serious case, somebody who is depressed and can't snap out of that depression, the reason that person can't snap out of the depression is also presentism. Because right now, they can't imagine a, view, a future that would be different from how they feel right now. I'll show you these cards. Please pick one. And remember it. Everybody picked the card? Yeah. Excellent. So, what does that mean? If you basically just would follow those rules, would you already be happy? Well, I'm not 100% sure. But I'll show you these cards again. And I remove the card that you picked. Correct? 
So not just a graphic designer, but clearly also a magician. And, but because I don't have to make a living as a magician, I unusually will tell you how I did this. I exchanged all of the cards. But very much likely because you only looked at the cards that you picked and didn't really remember what all the other ones looked like, uh, I could, at least for a second, fool you. At the show we had many things, among them a little uh, uh, push button that when you pushed it, you got a card with an instruction of what to do next in the happy show. And we had 50 different cards in there, and one of those was uh, uh, this one, this is my cell phone number, so I got tons and tons of jokes all the time. Also it was very handy for me to see how successful the exhibition is, because when it was in Paris, of course, I was not in Paris all the time, but I, I knew that if I got 10 jokes in a day, that at least 500 people must have visited the, uh, must have visited the exhibition. And in the United States, I mostly got this very sweet kind of very family uh, oriented jokes and then when the show moved to France the jokes became somehow more existential very much like you would think of, of the Parisians. <laughs> we, just like I did before with you, we measured everybody's happiness with these chewing gum machines, you know, you picked the column that, uh, how you felt uh, in the show, and this was how it started in Philadelphia. This was after two weeks in Philadelphia. This was after two weeks in Toronto, so you can see the Canadians being much happier than the United States people. And we also had a whole bunch of sugar cubes uh, built up for this typography that says step up to it and there was a projection on the sugar cubes and a, uh, a little hidden camera could actually monitor the viewers and could decide if they were smiling or not smiling and when the viewers were smiling the projection turned colorful and the viewers noticed this and basically smiled for the projection so we had a whole bunch of very happy people in the show and as you all know, smiling is contagious, so that corner of the show was always somehow in a good mood. When I talked to Jonathan Haidt, in sort of like the initial talk, he of course went through a whole bunch of lists to test me to see if I have the skills to be happier, or, or to, to become happier. And I don't, I actually was pretty good in many, many things, and I wasn't so good in many of the other things. And so I'll tell you, because of the negativity bias, it's much more interesting to hear what I wasn't good at, so I'll show you three of the things that I wasn't good at. Thankfulness was one that I was really not good at. So, uh, for example, normally, I never thank the organizers of these talks. <laughs> this time, however, I will. <laughs> Wanna come up? There's a couple. Is Anna around as well? Anna, yeah. Yeah, and there is one more Anna, no? That, was, that I was always emailing with. Anna? Anna, you're here? But in any case, they were, here is the deal. This is a total pain in the ass to organize. On top of it, I actually missed my flight in Tokyo. So they had to completely rebook the flight. I think you said you had like a shock that uh, almost killed you when I sent the mail that I'm not on the flight as promised. So this is a lot of really shitty work by people who normally don't organize this stuff. So. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Number two, sympathetic empathy. I think when I had the conversation with Jonathan, I was really bad at that. 
But I do think that that was one thing that I actually got better in the process of doing the film and the show. And possibly even the meditation that I did in Bali helped, but in general I think I got more empathetic. And uh, we definitely did a piece about it that joined the show later on. It's uh, sounds generated, you have this fluid in these letters, and the waves of every letter influences the waves of the next letter, and every word influences the other word, so all together, of course, it says, feel, others feel. And three, humility. I am not a humble person, but uh, I know so many people who are not humble, who are my friends, and I like them a lot, so actually I don't give a shit, uh, I leave that as it is. We also had a sort of like little drawing station in the show that just basically said, draw your symbol of happiness. And people, and it was already, it's already said, no smiley faces, but we got a lot of drawings back that we didn't really know what to do about. And so in the third show, I just changed the text and said, draw an animal that you think is doing well. And then we got thousands and thousands of drawings, meaning, I think overall we had roughly 100,000 drawings and we made some, uh, it was sort of like for a while, it was the job of every new intern to animate these little things and you see some of them. These are all animals that are doing well as drawn by visitors of the parish shop. You get the idea, there are many, many coming along here. We also had a whole bunch of bananas uh, in there that originally at the opening of the show said self-confidence produces fine results and it was green bananas and yellow bananas, and then a week later, that confidence was gone, and two weeks later, three weeks later, and four weeks later, the confidence somehow came back, but not quite, but over the whole course of the show, it smelled very strongly of bananas uh, in there. We had a whole bunch of our favorite uh, research uh, up on the wall. This is a comparison of research that Jonathan had done that compares companionate love towards passionate love. And, of course, if you look at it from a six-month point of view, the passionate love is so much stronger than the companionate, the friendshipy love. But then he also talked to many couples who were married for more than 40 years, and he found that if you look at it from a 60-year human lifespan point of view, the, the uh, uh, passionate love is exposed to what it is, kind of like a flash in the pan, while the long-lasting thing is really the companionate love. The couples that Jonathan interviewed basically all talked about companionate love with a little bit of passion mixed in there. And Jonathan actually says that it's biologically impossible to be companionate in love, so to be passionately in love for more than six months because you have extremely high levels of dopamine in the body and they would be very harmful to your body if they would be in the body for a longer period of time. And the only couples 
where he could measure those high levels of dopamine for longer than six months are couples where one partner was not available. Meaning like, you know, lived in Japan or was married to somebody else. We also had, I wanted to have a sort of exercise element in the show because I had found out for myself that if I exercise 15 minutes in the morning, it actually makes a bigger difference how my day goes than if I meditate for half an hour. So we had this bike in there and if you got on the bike and you know uh, really uh, worked it hard, you generated the electricity that would fire up a neon sign right in front of it. And the neon sign, I think it comes along in a second, the neon sign says, actually doing the things I set out to do increases my overall level of well-being. Meaning that if I have an idea and I said, oh, I really should do this, and if I then don't do it, it leaves a little morsel of discontent in my brain. And if I have many of those morsels, like if I have many things that I said, oh, I should do this and I don't do them, these little, little parts of discontent form to a really big ball of discontent. So I really should be uh, going for them. And if there is anything during this lecture that triggers something that you should do, write it down and put it in your calendar system and immediately put a time frame to it. You know, divide it up into, oh, I have this much time to do this and then this much time to do this and this much time to do this. I do it all the time and I find I then have to make sure that these things, once they're in the calendar, are really holy meaning they can't be pushed out by something like, you know, a client work that has a deadline attached to it. And I found that in this way, I really do get the stuff done that I actually want to do. Before I put that into the system, I always had an excuse for not doing them by a commercial job that pushed it out. And I found that I used the commercial jobs as an excuse for not having to do my own work. Because in reality, the own work is often more difficult to do than the commercial stuff, because the commercial stuff I really know how to do. So I told myself, oh, I'm just pushing it out because this thing has a deadline and I have to do it, but in real life, it was an excuse. So, what makes us unhappy? All the stuff that you would think, meaning oppression, inequality, the long commute to work was a surprising thing to me because normally these sort of like not so important things we get used to and we take them for granted but apparently we don't get used to a long commute to work. And the last one was crime and again there is a, a, a fantastic study by an acquaintance of mine, Steven Pinker, he is a quite famous a uh, sociologist at Harvard, and he shows that over the last 2,000 years, crime has always declined in every single century. So, in the 20th century, fewer people died by the hand of another man in war, in, in criminal activities, than in the 19th, even though the 20th century had World War I and World War II in there, by percentage, that's the only way you can look at it, fewer people died in the 20s and the 19s, fewer people died in the 19th century than in the 18th, and so forth and so on. And if you look at a medium violent tribe, the Hulis in Papua Guinea, they are untouched by outside influence, and if you now would live among the Hulis, a very colorful tribe, all was on the cover of National Geographic magazine, but if you live now among the Hulis, your chances to be killed by another man are seven times as high than they live in Detroit, which is America's most dangerous city. So basically what Pinker says, and I agree, is that civilization works. Things actually do become better. 
And if you look at the numbers in 2017, there has never ever in the history of humankind been such a peaceful time as now. There has never been so few people living in poverty as they are now. In 2016, last year, more people died from being too fat than died from starvation. First time in history. There's never been that many people living in democracies and uh, there has never been a time when relatively so many women were empowered uh, in, the, in the history of humankind. So things do actually get better. If I look at, sum up what makes us happy, pretty clear, I already talked about it, many friends and good friends, a sense of accomplishment, non-repetitive activities, religion, and then that last one, singing in groups. So you can probably know what's coming now. Can I ask you all to get up? All right, so this is one fantastic choir. We're going to do karaoke. And I brought the song, and it's a German song, but I think you know it. I can just run it. And the words will come up, and you will have to sing properly. Like really shout it out, otherwise it's not going to work. Like really sing out. Oh my clients drive me crazy, never show my God's help. No, the, the thing is, you have to imagine you're a giant choir. You're all singing together, so nobody gives a shit if you're off tune or so. But what I really give a shit is that you have to really press. I want to hear the last row all the way to up here. Okay, so we'll just continue this wants to see a new direction. Directions for tomorrow's cross and line. These there was and these dissections we were not this bright to shine. All my clients drive me crazy, never show no gods at all. For the penis that they made me think it longer than we know. Stefan always shows the same stuff, seen it all. table and I write down three things that works today. So likely tonight I'm going to write in there, I really made the audience sing. <laughs> Worked beautifully. The reason that uh, this technique has come up by the father of positive psychology, his name is Martin Seligman at the University of Pennsylvania, and he has fantastic scientific research that shows why this works, how it works, and that it works. Basically, it finds that it fights the negativity bias. It, uh, it allows you to sleep in with three things that you normally, that your brain normally doesn't really acknowledge that this stuff works. So this can be tiny little things that you stood, that you chose the line in the bank that was the shortest one, or this can be very big things. 
but it takes me normally 30 seconds, 45 seconds at night, and it actually makes a difference. So let's see. Number, number zero, who feels like shit? <laughs> who is pretty bad? Number two, one person. Who is bored? Four. Those people who were bored before must have left. Uh, <laughs> things are okay. Number six, a couple of people. I feel good. Number eight. All right. Uh, I love life. Number ten. <laughs> wow. So almost everybody is now in between. Uh, number 8 and number 10. Well, meaning I have to admit that I think this is temporary. <laughs> you won't get permanent happiness out of this lecture. And probably not even long-lasting one. Because, uh, you know, expecting that a lecture on happiness would actually make you happier is kind of like watching an exercise video and expecting it to make it to make you skinnier. Uh, you will have to do the exercises, of course, yourself. And but we did do a uh, make a little video about that things are better now. That's called now is better, and it's dedicated to Stephen Pinker. <coughs> can think, well, this guy lived in the United States for too long and he's now like, you know, all about happiness. So, like, you know, you can of course always go to the happy shop for the happy stuff or take some happy pills or if nothing happens, you can still go and visit this guy. about anything. They can be, if you have trouble with your boyfriend, <laughs> I'm excellent at that, uh, or yeah. about really anything else, we about design to. or clients or whatever, whatever you desire. And I know the first one is always scary uh, to ask. No, 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 we have, we have uh, one. What is the happiest moment in my life? Well, I would say the first one that comes to my mind, we actually have on film. Uh, I, as you, if you go and see the film tonight, you'll see the, I was, 
I would say all my happiest moments have something to do with falling in love. And there was one particular one in the film where I fall in love with a German woman that's just, was just crazy. I mean, as you see, I was also on drugs, so uh, uh, at the time I wasn't quite sure if it had any influence or not. Uh, now I know a little bit more about it, but I would think that would be the first one that comes to my mind, yes. Another question? Yeah. Sorry? Uh, you said that you are for the last two years living in the United States. Oh, for much longer, since 25 years. <laughs> yeah. The origin for Europe, yeah? I'm from Austria, yes. Austria, yes. And what the difference between heaven there and heaven in the United States? Yeah, uh, so there's a big difference. I would say that... But even within Austria, I would say there's a big difference. In where I come from, which is very, very close, to the border of Switzerland. I think it's, happiness is mostly seen or is part and parcel more close to meaning, so that third one. And many people try to do their job really well because they find meaning in their job and not just the high-end jobs, but let's say in my hometown you can go to a butcher and he will be a fantastic butcher. You know, that's just like, Everything is laid out beautifully. It's like you can see there is pride in his work. In Vienna, it's sort of different. I think the Viennese think of happiness sort of like closer to stupidity. And like, you know, there is a widespread view that if you're happy, you must be stupid because if you would be intelligent, you would understand how terrible life is. <laughs> and uh, many, this, I know that this is quite prevalent as you go more east from, from Vienna. So I'm not quite sure if that's the case in the Ukraine, but it's definitely the case in Vienna. And while uh, in the States it's much more widely expected as a, as a right, and you know, very famously it's part of the United States Constitution, the pursuit of happiness is in the Constitution, and I think because of that widespreadness that also has its own problems because people kind of expect it and then are disappointed when they don't get it. So I can say from the experience that we had with the show, the show started in the United States and did many cities there and when it went to Europe I was quite specifically Paris and Vienna I was quite ready to get negative press or to get sort of like comments like this. And it was actually vice versa. It had many more viewers both in Paris. I would say Paris, Vienna and Frankfurt were the most successful stops in, of the whole show. My, my, my theory why that is so is because it's not a subject that's very so often openly talked about. And there was sort of like a backlash against that dryness. But there's clearly, I would say there's clearly differences. While now, I'm, right now I'm on sabbatical again, so I'm living in Tokyo. And Tokyo, I would say, is quite close to Switzerland, or where I was originally born, the very western part of Austria, where people are quite restrained, they're not very emotional. But they, they might not have many friends, but they definitely have good friends. But there is a big, sort of like a big gap to, to get from an acquaintance to become a friend. And they're very concentrated on doing what they do really well, no matter if they get paid a lot or, a lot or not. I mean, I've, I've seen in Tokyo so many bars and so many restaurants that are run by one or two people. And you, like, you know, I've been to bars in Tokyo that have eight seats. Now, I know enough about running a bar that it's impossible to make any money with a bar with eight seats. This is basically a, you do it out of love for this thing. And these bars are fantastic. They all have something very special. You really want to be there. But they're also, and they're made by a person 
who makes this for joyous reasons. They always wanted a bar and they made the bar and even if it makes little money they don't give a shit because that's what they want to do and that's sort of like a very Swiss kind of attitude that I find. Yeah. Yeah. Stefan. Sorry? Why you to Tokyo Oh, why did I choose Tokyo? Yeah. So, uh, I did the first sabbatical many years ago in New York because it was such a new thing for me and I was so scared for doing it that I couldn't think of doing it somewhere else. Then the second one I did uh, in Indonesia because I wanted a different experience. And then for the third one, I wanted a different experience again. So I did, three, this time I'm doing three different places. I, was, I started in October with four months in Mexico City, then four months Tokyo, and then I'll do a tiny little village in Austria for the last four months. And I chose Tokyo because I'm working on a, a, on a big new project about beauty, basically that had a lot, has a lot to do with why in most Western countries beauty has fallen on the wayside in the 20th century and hasn't been taken seriously neither in architecture nor fine art nor design. I don't know of a single graphic design company in the United States that would have the guts to answer a question of the client, why did you do it that way, with the answer, because it's beautiful. Uh, and I can prove that this would be a fantastic answer, but to, back to your question, I think that Japan, because it's so isolated, was the only first world nation in the 20th century who kept beauty on the forefront. And I can go to, it's, this is true also in graphics, meaning, I'm not sure if you can get that here, but the Tokyo Type Directors Club book is the most beautiful book of all the award books in the world. It's actually the only one that we regularly check because most of the work in there is form-based and you can really see how they concentrate on it. Uh, but the same would be true to a lesser degree in fine art because Japanese fine art isn't that important culturally, meaning museums are still they're changing now, but they are surprisingly empty, with exceptions. Uh, but it's definitely true for Japanese design, also product design. They have an extremely high standard. It's even true for mass things. Let's say you have, you have convenience stores here like 7-Eleven and Lawson's and these things. So if you go to a 7-Eleven in Tokyo, the packaging is actually beautiful. Not all, but most of it. And I'm actually, I might even for the next project, just buy 50 packages from Tokyo. It also has something to do, I hear, and I found a, an interesting explanation for it, it actually has something to do with Buddhism. Most Japanese are Buddhists, and it's very strange that the more ephemeral something is, the more beautiful it is. So let's say the little paper band that holds the, stock, the chopsticks together, absolutely gorgeous, the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. The table setting in the restaurant, wonderful. The restaurant, pretty good, but you could see that in the West as well. The house, the building where the restaurant is in, mediocre. The street where the building is in, pretty shitty. City planning, total piece of shit. So it's, it's completely vice versa. Everything that's important, they don't give a shit about. Everything that's ephemeral, that's super tight. That also has something, that also would be an explanation why graphic design is taken so seriously. Let's say in Tokyo, in the most expensive district in Tokyo is Ginza. And the only art galleries that would be able to afford to have even a sixth or seventh floor gallery in Ginza are maybe half a dozen. But there is one graphic design gallery in Ginza that's on the ground floor in the most expensive space. So basically the most prestigious real estate in all of Tokyo is a graphic design gallery. And some graphic designers like Tadonori Yoko also are 
very much household names. I've seen a book about Tadadori Yoko that is just about the books that came out about Tadadori Yoko. So it's a book that just has the book covers, and there must be 150 in there, about the books that exist about this graphic designer. So it's, uh, they take it pretty seriously. And of course, uh, I've been to Tokyo before, but I wanted to have some more immersion, like some more immersion in that sort of scene. Yeah. That's a good question. Ukraine. <laughs> Sorry? Ukraine. <laughs> well, if I would be really, really depressed and I wanted to recover from this, I would definitely change countries. Because I think that change by itself already is a good thing. I can tell you when. Well, oh. Uh, I would say the last six months in the studio in New York, I wasn't depressed, but I was pretty lame. I was sort of like getting ready for the sabbatical, and I did the jobs as I'm supposed to do, but I was pretty lame. And when I moved to Mexico City, it literally was like a light switch. I mean, it was literally, I went from working six or seven hours a day, sort of like, oh, I've done this before, I'll give you shit, to being totally excited about graphic design again and working even though nobody was there to monitor me and nobody was there that I could impress with my hard work, I started to work 12, 13 hours a day. And so I think that the change by itself is great. And then if I would, out of everywhere that I've been, I think Bali is a pretty good choice because you can do Bali pretty much on every level. So if you're rich, you can do it on the high end where you pay, you know, you book yourself into a hotel room that costs a thousand dollars a night, but you can also do it in a guest house or you can rent, uh, you can easily rent. Uh, there's tons and tons of houses up there for rent. There's tons and tons of websites. There's tons and tons of Airbnbs. You can like that starts at 30 bucks a night. So you can do it fairly cheap. And I think that, and I've been there for, I've lived there all together for a year and a half, so this is not just a touristy kind of observation. I think that the Balinese are a particularly kind people. So it's very easy to, to fit in. There's a, there, are very, there are different scenes also of interesting foreigners to various degrees, more so in the center of Bali than in the coastal area. Uh, but, and of course it would be, if you come from the Ukraine, it would be a big change both culturally and weather-wise and all that. So yeah, I think as a direct answer, I, I would definitely go to the change and I would probably pick Bali. Yeah. Can I describe the most happy, the happiest person I've ever met in my life? Yes. Uh, I would say this would be three people. One is a guy called Robert Wong, a good friend of mine who runs the creative lab at Google in New York. And I think in his, well, I think in all of those cases it's partly genetic. I am convinced that Robert Wong, I didn't know him when he was a baby, but I've known him now for 30 years, but I'm convinced that Robert Wong was a happy baby. Uh, but also, I think that the first two, him and Annie, an ex-girlfriend of mine, have an incredibly unusual self-confidence. And that makes them... That makes them strangely satisfied with what they have. And not fearful, because both of them are quite talented, both Robert and Annie, so they can, 
like Andy is a fashion designer, but she's also a fantastic cook, and she, uh, uh, so they have a couple of legs that they're really good at, so it's, let's say, like, my own happiness, or my own, no, I would say this, my own self-confidence has a lot to do with design. If you would take design out of my life, you would change who I am significantly. I think you could take fashion design out of Annie's life and she would, whatever, open a restaurant to do this or do that. So those two and then the third one would be my, my oldest sister, Christine, who uh, is just an incredibly caring person and I think that caring makes her unbelievably strong. In New York, it has become kind of unfashionable to be, to have kids, or it not unfashionable, the status to be a mother has come down. And so I know in New York, I know a good number of women who are swimming, I mean, by swimming I'm meaning like kind of lost, guys actually too, because that possibility to just basically have a family doesn't really come with a high status, and I think that's a big mistake. Uh, even though I have no meaning, I'm not a family man, so I'm arguing against my own life here. But if I look at my sister, I think she is, a lot of her happiness actually comes from making sure that other people are happy. And that is a comment that my friend Marian Bantias, who some of you might know, she's a fantastic calligrapher and a very, very good typographer, she actually mentioned that to me once when I was in the middle of putting the happy film together. She said, maybe the, the real secret to happiness is stop caring about your own, but caring about other people's instead. And there is some research out there that actually shows that. Or there's definitely very, very good research that shows, uh, where, that talks about the connection with happiness and money. And I think I mentioned some of it before that you're better off spending it on an experience than spending it on something that you buy and own. But strangely, the best way that you, like, if you, if, if you want to spend money to make yourself happier, research shows very clearly that the best way to do it is to spend it on other people, which is counterintuitive, but apparently true. And this is Gallup research, so this is not some little university. This is like, you know, 600,000 people uh, participated. So this is, I think, fairly believable research. When I came across, uh, you know, when I looked at all this research, it became, and talked to many scientists, it became clear to me that many people in the sciences differentiate between authoritative research and non-authoritative research, because basically I can make any argument pretty much about anything by googling a little bit and finding a piece of research that basically uh, underlines my, my argument. So I tried to uh, have in the show and in the, in the film, I mean the film there's not a lot of research apparent anyway, but in the show we tried to have only research in there that came from very good sources. Okay? Yeah? Yep. Yeah. Hi. Hi. First of all, it's really cool to see you here. Thank you for this opportunity. And my question is not about happiness, or maybe it is. Uh, what do you think is the main goal of your design? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, what do I think is the main goal of graphic design? I think it is to help people and to delight people. If I can do a piece of work that does that, or does one of them, or does both, my job is done. And sometimes, of course, that's difficult to say. You know, let's say, let's pick one of the most commercial jobs we did recently. So we did a job for India to sell mango juice. And if I look back at that, I would say it definitely helped the client because they sold much more mango juice after our campaign. Did it help the Indian people? Probably not. Or did it delight them? Yes, some of them. Because, and I know because they left 
they, they sent mails. And they, I think we tried to do a campaign that would not go on, everybody, on anybody's nerves, but actually be fun to see and would actually make a highway or a, a cityscape more beautiful rather than less beautiful. But I think that that thing, does it, is, does it help somebody and does it delight somebody, is pretty much true for almost every profession. Like even that's true, would be true for journalism, it would be true for bricklayers. Like it does, you know, it's, it, I think it's not just graphic design related. Oh. And of course, it being graphic design, meaning it's design, it has to work. Like if it doesn't work, it's not, it's not design. There's a fantastic quote by an American artist, Donald Judd, who says the difference between art and design is that design has to work, art does not. Art can just be, and therefore doesn't really have to do anything. It can be useless. I think there's a famous Oscar Wilde quote out there that says, all art is useless, and he meant it as a compliment, that it's that space where it doesn't have to do anything. It's also my strong belief that the reason Museums of contemporary art are so wildly visited now, even though so much of the work is so difficult and clearly can't be quite understood by the masses who go and see it. Tate Modern is the second most visited institution in all of the, in the, of all of the uh, United Kingdom. The reason I think that that is, works so well for many people is because, it, because of its uselessness. I think that we all need in our life useless things. And I can give you another example. Everybody enjoys a walk in the park more than a commute. But from a utility standpoint, the commute is much higher than a walk in the park. The walk in the park has almost no utility. Meaning, you start somewhere and you go back to that point. So from a, it's not really useful, but it's very enjoyable. And I think that art is like that, but design really needs to have a function for it to be called design. So all the graphic design that we do needs to do something. In the case of the very commercial stuff, let's say like the mango juice for India, it needs to sell the mango juice. That's one of its criteria. But while it's doing that, it hopefully also delights somebody. Or the same, let's say, if we look at less commercial jobs, we just did the uh, identity for a Museum of Contemporary Art. It needs to be impactful on that museum. It has to have, make a difference for that place, right? a discernible difference. If it doesn't do that, it failed. Like I'm convinced, let's say, that's part of the reason why I like being a designer. If I design a Rolling Stones cover, and I think it's a good cover, but the Rolling Stones fans think it's a bad cover, then it is a bad cover. No matter if I think it's good or not. Because it didn't fulfill its function. Uh, that definitely is part of it. But if, it's, but if it all it does is sell CDs and doesn't do anything else, if it doesn't delight somebody, then I think it's a bad cover anyway. Okay, look, you're in the back. So is, is it possible to, to have happiness forever or is there a part where you have to feel sadness? Yeah, yeah. If there's a point where I, I do something, for example, and from this point I feel happy forever in my life, is it possible? Not possible. Yeah, no. I think that uh, I talked to one great psychologist in the UK, Daniel Nettles is his name, and he talked about happiness as a carrot. So basically as a carrot that hangs in front of us and sort of shows us the way, but we can only reach it for a very short time and uh, then it goes away again. 
And he basically says that it's been designed by evolution as a carrot, as a compass. And of course, a compass that would always point north is useless. And if we actually would achieve permanent happiness, we would just sit down and eat sweet and fatty food all the time and become obese. And that's not the, that's not the strategy that evolution has in mind for us. Evolution wants us to develop, so sadness and anger will always be part of it. And actually it is a, an interesting conclusion that I sort of make in the film, but, but I do make it in the film, but I would now, if I could make the ending of the film over, which I will not, I won't touch that film, but uh, I would actually make it much more forceful. And it's, let's say, Jonathan Haidt ends his book with a conclusion. And I always sort of like understood this conclusion with my brain, but I never really got it until we completed the whole film and I was totally done with it. And he basically says, So the, let's say the Buddhists and the Stoics say that happiness comes from within. And people in the West say happiness comes from getting what you want. It comes from outside. And he says neither is true, it comes from in between. And what he means by that is that it comes from if you're able to have a good relationships with other people. This could be lovers, family, and friends, then if you set that up and if you really try to have these relationships working and you are pushing them and you are creating them, then every once in a while happiness can come from in between you and those relationships. And the same is true for work, that every here and there it can come from in between if you set it up correctly. And then the third would be uh, uh, something that's bigger than yourself. So that could, for many people, that's religion. For other people, that might be a movement, that might be revolution, or that might be whatever, uh, uh, some left-wing or right-wing movement, something that's bigger than yourself. And if you set that up correctly, there could be happiness coming in, coming out from there. And I think I got it the first time meaning truly understood it, maybe 10 years of boring people out there. And he had to say, oh, that's okay, and he thought about it, and then he came back to the journalist and said, everybody who is honest is interesting. And that really, this was, in the, this was a long time ago, and it was just when we started re, uh, writing, or when I started writing my part of the Made You Look book, which is the one with the dog on the cover. And it just hit me, it seemed, oh, that's fantastic. If I write it really honestly, then it's going to be interesting. And of course, as a designer, you want to do things that are interesting. And uh, that seemed to have worked very well for the book. Like, you know, we wrote in there how much, every, how, how much money we made for every project. If I like the project or not, I put like from one to five, I graded every project that we did and so on. And it seemed to work very well. So from then on we sort of like used it somewhat as a strategy to be interesting, uh, but also because I do feel that being truthful is a real important maybe one of the few morals that I left untouched. You know, I was born uh, in a time where I, my formative years in Austria were uh, at a time when, you know, sort of like every traditional moral was questioned, definitely patriotism, definitely sort of loyalty, and sort of, I would say, truthfulness was one of the few morals that kind of, that wasn't questioned. So I always took it seriously. And as far as I know, there is no 
uh, there is no untruthfulness in the film. Cool. Yeah, and I believe I will be honest and uh, the audience will help me that uh, your lecture here now in Kiev makes them happier. And we want to thank you with a great applause.